ways to kind of warm up the crowd. Uh, one of them is a wave, and the other is a chant. So uh, uh, just kind of get us in the, the, the mood to talk about exploit kits. Uh, I would like to try a wave. I'm going to start over here. I'm going to run over here. Excellent. One more time. Ready? Woo! All right. I washed my hands in the restroom earlier, and there are no paper towels. Well, that worked well. Uh, the other is a chant, and uh, since I'm talking about exploit kits, I would like to do a chant saying exploit kits. Exploit kits. Exploit kits. Exploit kits. Exploit kits. Exploit kits. I can cross that off my bucket list now. Well, uh, for this presentation, we're gonna I'm gonna do an introduction, talk about exploit kit, the concept, talk about an exploit kit ecosystem, discuss some uh, common exploit kits, talk about examining exploit kit traffic, and finally we'll discuss uh, what should be our best defense. I currently work at uh, Palo Alto Networks Unit 42, which is the public face of threat research for the company. I also run the malware traffic analysis uh, .net website. I speak or uh, I write diaries for the uh, uh, Internet Storm Center, and I tweet fairly frequently at malware underscore traffic. So first things first, in order to understand the exploit kit concept, you have to understand that there are two main methods that criminals use for mass distribution of malware. The first method requires user action, which is a malicious spam or pop-up windows during web browsing. Here's an example of malicious spam. It's a zip file attachment. You open it up, and that's not an exploit or Excel spreadsheet at all. The other one is the pop-up windows that you'll see during web browsing. In either case, you have plenty of warning that you're going to do something wrong. Uh, you're warned that this type of file could harm your computer. Do you really want to run that file? And the average user, well, they're a clicker, so they'll click right through that stuff. But still, I, I figure any one of us here in this room uh, is smart enough to know, to understand what's going on there. The second method happens behind the scenes without the user's knowledge, and this is the method used by exploit kits, where you take a criminal group's malware, send it to the average user's computer. Behind the scenes. A little scary, right? Halloween's coming up. Exploit kits distribute malware targeting systems running Microsoft Windows. To understand the exploit kit concept, we need to clearly define what a vulnerability in an exploit is before we can define what an exploit kit is. A vulnerability is an unintended flaw in software code that leaves it open to exploitation in the form of unauthorized access or malicious behavior. These are cataloged in the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures Database, uh, CVE numbers. Here's one for Adobe Flash Player. If you look at the definition of it, or the description, I should say, Adobe Flash Player 21.0.0.226 and earlier allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code via unspecified vectors as exploited in the wild in May 2016. It should be as of May 2016. And I love this. This is politician speak, right? Arbitrary code via unspecified vectors? The, the, there's nothing arbitrary about this code. It's malware. Right? Why would you, why would you try to execute arbitrary code? That's, why do you say that? And unspecified vectors, this is exploit kits. I, but you, every, for 
these uh, CVEs for these vulnerabilities, you will always see it described in that way. Arbitrary code via unspecified vectors. Just call it what it is, malware, in this case, for this exploit or this vulnerability uh, via exploit kits. An exploit is a file or a piece of code that takes advantage of a vulnerability in an application. A file or a piece of code. So I can go into a packet capture of traffic uh, that I've collected, open it up in Wireshark, scroll through trying to export some of the HTTP objects, find a flash file, export that because in this case I know it's a flash exploit, and uh, there it is. By itself, an exploit, although it's malicious, it will not infect your computer. So, for example, if you have a Word document exploit, that exploit by itself, if it's sitting on your computer, it, it, or that, that code or that file is not going to do anything unless it happens to be a Word document. And then Word will open it up and execute that exploit in a particular fashion. So, this flash exploit that I've uh, exported from Wireshark, from this traffic, if I double click it on my desktop, it's not going to do anything. It needs to work under a specific set of circumstances. And exploit kits uh, are a way to do that. An exploit kit, this is probably the best definition uh, that I've seen of exploit kits. A server-based framework that uses exploits to take advantage of vulnerabilities in browser-based applications to affect a client, a laptop or desktop, without the user's knowledge without any additional action by the user except from casual web browsing. So you might ask yourself what are vulnerabilities that exploit kits target? Anybody have any guesses? Flash? That is the big one right now. Flash is uh, really, really big. Another one is browsers. Internet Explorer is uh, probably the biggest one. That's correct, Java. Silverlight is probably the third most popular one. Common, I should say. Java and PDF exploits. Those were very, very common in exploit kits up until uh, about a year, year and a half ago. Any of the current leading modern exploit kits that are out there, I have not seen Java or PDF being exploited. I have seen Flash almost across the board now. Browser-based exploits, pretty much Internet Explorer and to a much, much lesser extent, Microsoft Silverlight. Exploit kits have turned to a software as a service model, SaaS, platform as a service model, PaaS, however you want to say it. I call it exploit kits as a service, which uh, uh, that term is caught on, but the acronym, uh, how I pronounce it, EKAS. I've gotten slapped for that before, and I'm told I shouldn't say that in front of a large crowd while I'm being recorded. But uh, uh, hopefully you'll see that acronym uh, uh, out a little bit more. We should be talking about exploit kits a bit more, in my personal opinion. So we're renting an exploit kit. We're not buying it, much like... Uh, we're uh, uh, software EULA for Microsoft Windows. We're, uh, we're, we're buying the rights to run it. In this case, you're just renting the service. You don't really get any code like you would uh, uh, if you're uh, buying Microsoft Windows. So how much does it cost? Well, in April 2016, the Checkpoint blog published a study on nuclear exploit kit. And in it, they said that leading exploit kits are sold in cyber criminal circles for a few thousand dollars a month. That is just Benjamins a day. In June 2016, MalwareDon'tNeedCoffee.com, the security researcher Caffeine that runs that site, he reported that Neutrino exploit kit cost $7,000 a month. That was shortly after Angular Exploit Kit disappeared from the Exploit Kit scene, uh, which was about that price. Prior to that, Neutrino was costing around $3,500 a month. 
So the exploit kits themselves, once you are actually able to cough up the dough and pay for it, you have yourself a server. And that server, in order to understand how it works, basically when your computer connects while web browsing to that server, it will first hit a landing page. The landing page generally for exploit kits tends to profile the machine to see what's vulnerable. Once it determines what is vulnerable on your machine, it will send an appropriate exploit. And if that exploit kit, or I'm sorry, if that exploit is successful as leveraged by the exploit kit, it will send a payload, which is your malware that will infect your computer. Once again, all this is behind the scenes. But this is your block diagram of the chain of events within the exploit kit. But exploit kits cannot exist by themselves. I cannot pay $7,000 a month for a Neutrino exploit kit server, have it out there, and expect people to come flock into it to come get infected. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, there's an ecosystem that exploit kits work through or exist in. And this, ex this ecosystem consists of actors and campaigns. An actor is an individual or a criminal group behind a particular piece of malware is the best way of looking at it. Now, actor is a theater term. Like uh, many theaters, there are good actors, uh, you know, the good guys, which would, uh, I presume, be all of us here in this room. And then there are the bad guys, which I've heard called bad actor. Now, I don't, don't like the term bad actor because that reminds me of people like Polly Shore or George <laughs> Clooney, both who are bad actors. I mean, that guy plays the same dumb character in every movie, and uh, I don't particularly care for Polly Shore either. <laughs> Threat actor, that's uh, what I like to call them. Uh, if I have to call them anything other than actor, that's a uh, common term. So if you hear the term threat actor, that's where it's coming from. So a campaign is a system that consists of an exploit kit plus an infrastructure that directs potential victims to that particular exploit kit. So you got to have a campaign set up if you have an exploit kit. And that's what some people don't understand. You see an exploit kit, uh, an alert for an exploit kit, you're thinking, well, I got hit by Neutrino, or I got hit by Rig Exploit Kit and sent that malware. Well, just because it's, for example, Rig Exploit Kit doesn't mean that you will always get this one particular piece of malware. It could be, there are different campaigns that use the various exploit kits out there, and they are sending different pieces of malware for the different actors that are using them. So an actor can use more than one campaign to distribute their malware that they're trying to push out there on a massive scale. And I've seen instances where a campaign can distribute malware for more than one actor. Where I've identified a particular campaign, in one hour it's sending one piece of malware, and then the next hour it's sending something completely different. So that indicates that there are there is another criminal organization that set up a campaign that's renting itself out to actors who are trying to distribute malware. So it's a, it can be a very complex sort of uh, criminal market there if you're in the market to uh, try and infect other people's computers. So in its simplest form, the chain of events for a campaign looks like this, where you have a compromised website, and that website will redirect traffic behind the scenes to an exploit kit server, which is also working behind the scenes. Now, compromised websites are a dime a dozen. Uh, if you look at anybody's malicious URL feed, you will see occasionally a, a good percentage of them are, they, they look like just regular websites, and you'll check them, and they're legitimate websites. They're not set up specifically to attack anybody or to have anything there. They're just people that uh, set up a WordPress site on their own and forgot to update it. It got, it got uh, owned. It got compromised. And sometimes you'll see different actors compromise the same website, and you'll find injected script from different campaigns in the same compromised website. But in its uh, uh, most basic form, any exploit kit infection always starts with a compromised website. 
Here's an example that I did uh, uh, last week. The website was panoplycapital.com, uh, which is common. It may be fixed by now, I don't know. But if you look, injected script, which I have highlighted here in this slide, uh, from what I call the pseudo dark leech campaign. The patterns of injected script are common among the campaigns. In this case, if you look uh, uh, in the span, it will put that iframe in a negative position relative to the viewable screen. So that stuff is all happening out of sight of the user. And the highlighted portion in yellow is a URL for a landing page for the Neutrino exploit kit. Sometimes campaigns will use another server that will act as a gate between the compromised website and the exploit kit server. I like to look at the gate as uh, that uh, bridge troll there in the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So much like in that movie, that bridge troll, that gate is uh, going to have ask you three questions before you can pass on to the exploit kit. First question, what is your operating system? So now, if you would say anything other than Windows, here's what happens. You're not going to that bridge. If you do say Windows, and that information is readily available in the HTTP request headers, you're one step closer to getting past the gate. Second question, what is your IP address? A lot of times, uh, campaigns will be specific to a particular geographical area. So, for example, if I've got a piece of malware that is German language, for some reason, I'm choosing an exploit kit to uh, somehow distribute this on a wide scale. I only want it to affect Germany. I'm only going to have it in some way, shape, or form. That gate will will throw me over the bridge, past the bridge, uh, outside of the bridge, if I'm not a German IP. But if I am the IP that's acceptable, I am one last step closer to getting past the gate. So the last question, as you're staring the gate down, the gate asks you, is that you again? A lot of uh, researchers will try to use the same compromised website to generate a chain of infection traffic. I've run through it before, where I'll infect a, uh, I will infect a host as I'm trying to generate exploit kit traffic, get a full infection chain, and something goes wrong. I'll have to try it again. If I try it again, and I'm using, the, uh, I'm coming from the same IP address, it's not going to work. That exploit kit, that gate, in this case, the gate, will not act. Here's an example from what I call the EI test campaign that was first identified by Malwarebytes in 2014 and is still going strong today. Here's the pattern of injected script, this particular website, and, and this one may already be uh, done, is, uh, it may already be fixed, uh, I'm trying to say, is from the EI test campaign. Highlighted in yellow are the URLs that go to the gate. And then the gate will return, if the conditions are right, the gate will return script that will direct you to the landing page of the exploit kit. It's kind of hard to see here. So here's the script that is returned. Now that gate is opened up outside the viewable uh, uh, frame of the user. In some campaigns, you might see a second or a third gate before you get to the exploit kit. And a lot of times, here's an example, where you can see pastebin is being used as a gate before you get to the second gate. So pastebin URL shorteners like goo.gl for a Google URL shortener, I've seen those plenty of times before, although not recently, but these are commonly abused by criminals. 
The thing uh, with something like Pastebin or something like Google is it's pretty easy to notify those companies and they'll quickly clear it up. However, it's easy enough for the criminals to go back in, uh, uh, you know, pull some sort of fraud and get more, uh, 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 set up another gate through a legitimate service like Pastebin or Google URL shortener or what have you. Common exploit kits. The three common exploit kits that I currently see are Neutrino, Rig, and Magnitude. At this point, these are just names. If anybody is uh, curious about other exploit kits, Angler was a big, big name, probably the biggest in 2015, and throughout June 7th, I believe, of this year. It was by far the most common one that I personally saw uh, when I was generating exploit kit traffic. But uh, Angular exploit kit disappeared about the time the criminal uh, gang for the Lurk uh, Trojan, banking Trojan, was arrested by Russian authorities back in June. Nuclear exploit kit disappeared from the scene in April 2016, and rumor has it that when Checkpoint released its big expose on nuclear exploit kit back in April, the one that I referenced earlier, that the criminal group or the author, whoever it was behind the nuclear exploit kit, said, that's it, I'm out of here, and he packed up shop and he just quit. After literally years and years of producing that particular exploit kit, which is interesting because now the exploit kit market is really not as saturated as it was uh, with different models of exploit kit as compared to two, three years ago. Other exploit kits that are not quite as common, Sundown is a kind of a Frankenstein's monster of exploit kits where it like robbed and stole from different exploit kits. So you would see traffic from Sundown and you would think it was Rig or you would think it was Nuclear Exploit Kit or maybe Angler. It just looked uh, uh, rather, rather weird. Hunter Exploit Kit is another one that's still out there. I personally have not intercepted this, but I've seen it on ThreatGlass.com where uh, there was an example there. And then you have some really, really uh, limited distribution exploit kits like uh, Kaizen, which I've only seen associated with traffic from South Korean websites. And Palo Alto Networks has a blog entry about a particular campaign distributing malware uh, that's targeted towards South Korean banks using this exploit kit. So if I'm going to examine exploit kit traffic, I need a few things before I can generate or see the, uh, to actually examine the exploit kit traffic. The first prerequisite, if you're going to generate exploit kit traffic, is you need to stay off your corporate network or your home network if you're doing this at home. Because if you infect your computer, there is a chance that you may get malware that happens to check shared drives or it may happen to, you know, just start scanning through the network that you're currently a part of and uh, uh, trying to affect other hosts. So if you're doing this, and the way I do it while I'm at home is I use a VPN service. And I went into detail on that when I was talking about my uh, uh, set up at home in the uh, Security Onion conference yesterday. That should be available at some point uh, publicly and you can check that out for details. Second thing I would need to generate exploit kit traffic is a vulnerable Windows host that is running an out-of-date version of Flash, Internet Explorer, Silverlight, Java, PDF, Adobe PDF Reader. The next thing I'll need is a compromised website to kick off the exploit kit infection chain. And although I don't need full packet capture to generate the traffic, I do need it to capture the traffic so I can actually look at it and see what happens. Some of the tools I use for examining exploit kit traffic, first there's Wireshark, Security Onion, which I talked about yesterday, and Snort or Suricata, which are intrusion detection systems, IDS uh, uh, programs that can 
uh, that I can use to generate alerts on the traffic and see what I've got. There's a screenshot of Wireshark for what that's worth. There's a screenshot of Security Onion. And I will be forever indebted to both of those, uh, uh, the Doug Burks and the crew at Security Onion and uh, the people behind Wireshark, because without those, I wouldn't be where I am today. Snort. Snort's pretty interesting because the the uh, um, the rules uh, that they the rule set that they have for Snort to detect stuff is a tiered model. So you've got a community rule set that you don't need an point code or anything special. If you're setting up Security Onion, for example, uh, uh, you might be able to use the uh, or should be able to use the open rule set, the community rule set. Uh, you can go to the snort.org website, you could register, and all you need for that, I believe, is just a valid email address. Then you can get an OINT code, and you can have a much more robust and comprehensive rule set than the community rule set for snort. And I've, uh, I've corresponded with some people through email who had been using the open community rule set for snort, and I'm telling them, hey, just register. Uh, the register rule set is only 30 days out of date from the subscriber rule set where you would have to pay money. And you can subscribe on snort.org. And uh, somebody was saying, I think it was somewhere around $50 a year, if I remember correctly. Suricata is another IDS, and uh, uh, it definitely is... It's an IDS, and it works in general the same way as Snort in that I see alerts from the traffic. I'll generally use the emerging threats side uh, for Suricata. Really, emerging threats in Suricata, the, the rule set for emerging threats goes with Suricata, much like the Snort slash Talos uh, registered rule set or those rule sets go with Snort. It's really, they're designed to work together. And I, you can mix and match those, but I don't recommend it. So if we're looking at individual exploit kits, first we'll look at magnitude. Magnitude is uh, generally, what I've seen it from, is malvertising campaigns. It uses profiling gates, and the payload, when it's sent over the network, is sent in the clear. And this is one of the few leading exploit kits that sends its payload in the clear. So you can actually detect this if you're running something like Security Onion and you have Bro and you can extract that EXE from the traffic. Another thing about Magnitude, from Proofpoint blog in April 2016, they're talking about the zero day back then. Uh, it was an Adobe Flash Player zero day, 2016-10-19. And for a period of about 24 hours, that Flash exploit was zero day, so it didn't matter if your computer was fully patched and up to date, if you ran across an exploit kit and you were running Flash Player, regardless of the version, it would get infected. In recent months, Magnitude seems to be used by only one actor who, since the end of March, has switched to distributing server or Kerber ransomware. Am I pronouncing that right? Ransomware? <laughs> Anyway, here's an example of Magnitude Exploit Kit in Wireshark traffic, in that I can see gates that are pointing to Magnitude Exploit Kit, and then I can see the actual Magnitude Exploit Kit uh, traffic. If I run it through Security Onion, running the Emerging Threats, the Suricata and the Emerging Threats Pro rule set, I will find various alerts that tell me this is Magnitude Exploit Kit. After a while, if you see this traffic often enough, you can ID it visually without the need for alerts. You can also submit PCAPs of exploit kit traffic, whether you find them from my blog or some other blog. You can submit them to VirusTotal, and it will run through both Snort, using the Snort subscriber rule set, and Suricata, using the Emerging Threats Pro rule set. So if I were to check Magnitude, I would see both sets of alerts, Snort and Suricata. And you'll see Magnitude, I want to say, on both of them. Now, Magnitude Exploit Kit has a profiling gate. And there are a couple of blogs that already go through the details. I'm not going to get too deep into here. But the first thing, this is a, the second gate 
in that tra that PCAP of track width that we had. So after it goes to the third, uh, the first gate, it goes to the second gate. The HTTP request actually contains the screen resolution of the computer, the victim host. So in this case, it was 1024 by 768 for the screen size. And then it has some uh, uh, code checking for Kaspersky antivirus. And there is another gate that's not present in this traffic where it will literally check for everything from Wireshark to uh, Fiddler to uh, VMware, any sort of virtual environments, and not send you to the exploit kit. It's an extra layer of protection from the people running this particular campaign to make sure that security researchers aren't trying to get through and pull samples, get ex examples of the traffic. Flash exploits are often used among many of the major exploit kits. If you look at uh, uh, traffic using Wireshark pulling up a TCP stream, you'll find where it says X Flash version in the HTTP headers, that's the version of Flash that the victim host is running. And the first three characters, uh, the first three bytes of uh, this is a Flash archive. ZWS or CWS are the, are the ASCII representations of the first three characters of any flash exploit that I've seen in the past couple of years. That's what was running on that my vulnerable host. It's just a browser header. This is ActiveX, an ActiveX plugin. So uh, anytime Flash is being used by this machine, whether it's the exploit kit or anything else, if it's using that ActiveX plugin, that XFlash version will pop up in the HTTP header. Uh, no problem. And the executable, the malware, is sent in the clear. So Rig Exploit Kit is a mid-tier exploit kit that has picked up some steam in recent weeks. When Angular Exploit Kit disappeared in June 2016, Neutrino, I saw Neutrino everywhere where previously I had seen Angular Exploit Kit. In the past couple of weeks, uh, the, one of the major campaigns I've been tracking, the EI Test campaign, switched from Neutrino to rig, and now it's just running rig. So I'm seeing a lot more rig exploit kit in the past couple of weeks. <laughs> All right, EI test is one of the campaigns that uses rig exploit kit. So earlier when I said uh, uh, an exploit kit cannot exist by itself, EI test is just what malware bytes first called it when they discovered it back in 2014. At, at the time, it always had EI test as one of the strings in the injected code. Now it doesn't, but it's still the same recognize, uh, recognizable pattern of injected code in that compromised website. So you can still identify it as what we're still calling the EI test campaign. It's the same guys. Right. Right. That's EI testers for what we're using to identify the campaign. The payload for Rig Exploit Kit is obfuscated. How is it obfuscated? It is XORed with an ASCII string, and I'll get to that later. So if I were to open up a PCAP of traffic exploited in this case through the EI test campaign. You've got your compromised website. You've got what we're calling the EI test gate. And then you've got rig exploit kit. If I'm running it through Security Onion like I did before, see a bunch of events for rig exploit kit. Once again, I can submit the PGAP to virus total and see the same information so I don't need to set up. Uh, security onion if I don't uh, want to for whatever reason. An interesting thing when rig exploit kit sends the payload. Now malware binary, an executable file for Windows, it will have a lot of bytes that are zero zero. 
So if you look in that area of the uh, uh, of the TCP string where all the zero zero bytes are represented, you're going to see that text string over and over and over again. The problem is where does it start and where does it end? So the way I figured it out is I go through the fourth byte from the very beginning is the first zero zero byte in the malware binder. So if I count back that shows K, a capital K. If I count back four from the capital K, that is your ASCII string that they're using to XOR the binary. And here's a Python script. I'm not going to leave it up uh, long enough for you guys probably to write it all down. Uh, this stuff will be available uh, afterwards. Or you can uh, 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 tweet me on Twitter or email me at the blog address, and I would be more than happy to uh, send you the text for that. Neutrino Exploit Kit. It's currently a top-tier exploit kit, even though it was not as good as Angular Exploit Kit was. Now with Neutrino, uh, currently it's the only leading exploit kit that I know of right now that is obfuscating the payload using an actual encryption algorithm. I want to say it's RC4, and they're using some sort of key, and I don't know what it is. So uh, personally, I don't worry about trying to deobfuscate the, the payload. I just pick it up from the infected host. So opening a PCAP of traffic with Neutrino Exploit Kit. See the compromised website, Neutrino Exploit Kit. The, uh, in this case, are calling it, I, I've been calling it the pseudo dark leech campaign. <coughs> if I had to run it in Security Onion using the Emerging Threats Pro rule set, we'll see plenty of alerts that show that this is Neutrino Exploit Kit. And once again, I can submit it to Virus Total and see the alerts there if I don't have access to Security Onion or some other IDS and SIM combination. So Neutrino Exploit Kit, really the only indications that, you're, that you have that it's a payload on a visual level is seeing in the HTTP response headers that the content type is an application slash octet stream and the content length is similar to the artifact that you would find that's the actual malware on the infected host. So what does an infection look like when you're browsing? Let's take a look. This one is not online anymore, this compromised website, it's called the Wine Group. So if I'm uh, sipping a glass of wine, smoking my cigar, part of the 1%, uh, browsing through, trying to find what type of wine I want, this is all happening real time. So you get an idea of the time it takes from the time that you first hit a compromised website to the time that the infection happens. And there it is. That pop-up window doesn't happen anymore. This is uh, Crypt Mic Ransomware, which is a, uh, a I believe it's a, a newer version or another uh, family. Uh, prior to that was Crypt XXX. All of my letters to the editor of Modern Bride Magazine are now going. So I would go through and I would check with this particular ransomware. It will pop up the browser window. I'll go through, find my files are encrypted, find I have to pay Bitcoin. And then I would use Security Onion and Wireshark to find the indicators of compromise, document that stuff, provide samples of the traffic and the IOCs on my website. Some observations based on my research. Ransomware is currently the most common payload for exploit kit traffic. So if your grandmother is at home and saying, I didn't do anything, my computer is now infected, uh, it's possible 
that it may have been an exploit kit that happened, if, uh, especially if she doesn't check her email. Legitimate sites and domains are frequently associated with exploit kit traffic. One of the things that I've seen is people will block legitimate websites. The compromised website that kicks off the infection chain, there's a uh, technique that exploit kits use called domain shadowing, where you've got a legitimate website and they compromise their domain uh, uh, registration credentials. And then they will set up servers. So uh, NewYorkTimes.com, for example, not that they've actually been compromised, but let's just say that their domain credentials were compromised. The criminals will use those domain credentials to set up other servers like random string of characters dot New York Times dot com. And then that's your malicious server. That's your exploit kit. New York Times dot com is not compromised. But those other domains are. And the last thing is exploit kit indicators are constantly changing. So even if you block something, if you block a particular domain or if you block a particular IP address, odds are within 24 hours, probably sooner, that's going to be an invalid, uh, uh, shouldn't say invalid, that's uh, going to be an ineffective way of blocking exploit kit traffic. So what's your best defense if it's so hard to detect and prevent this stuff? The first one is to keep your computers fully up to date and fully patched. Easy to say, and probably easy for every one of us in this room to do for our own stuff, kind of hard for our family members to do it. Kind of hard for grandma and grandpa to do it. Kind of hard for a large-scale enterprise with hundreds of thousands of computers to worry about to do. You can implement browsing restrictions. Uh, there's also group policy restrictions that you can do that would lessen the chance of malware if it actually gets to your machine through an exploit kit of being uh, executed. And finally, threat detection, prevention, and protection solutions, uh, uh, at least in the enterprise environment, are a way that many enterprises try to combat this threat. For example, you can go to the paloalto.com website and find a bevy of security solutions. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this since uh, Palo Alto Networks is paying for my trip here. So to summarize, we went over the exploit kit concept, exploit kit ecosystems, common exploit kits, examining exploit kit traffic, and your best defense. Now, we can do questions, however, what I would like to try is a little bit of Exploit Kit Jeopardy to kind of review some of the material that we've had. And there are prizes. So we got concepts, we got names, we got traffic. So let's, uh, somebody, uh, somebody raise a hand or somebody shout out uh, category and uh, uh, price. Who's that? Can raise your hand, sir. Traffic for 300. Okay, the traffic category. I'm gonna have a picture, a Wireshark capture of traffic that I just presented earlier, and you'll have to tell me, you, sir, will have to tell me what exploit kit that was. If you get it correct, you get this land turtle device. Here we go. What exploit kit is this? Can I give him a chance to answer? I see him in the back. You know? Yes, that is correct. Dang it. All right, sir, you had your hand up in the back earlier. Uh, yes, please. 
Traffic for 200. Look familiar? What is a? That is incorrect. Sorry. Anybody else? Uh, you, sir, Brandon. Pardon? That is correct. All right, we got time for one more question. So, uh, sir, concepts for three hundred. This is how an exploit kit is supposed to work. I, I'll be very liberal with this answer. Something simpler. In general. Sir, in the back. I'm pointing to you, yes. Uh, would be taking advantage of a vulnerability. True, true. Uh, all right. Anyone, just shout it out. Behind the scenes. There you go. Behind the scenes or while web browsing without any user action. Yeah, it's kind of hard. That, well, that's why it was a $300 question. <laughs> and uh, let's try one more here. Dang it. Name's 300. Commonly used in malvertising campaigns. First exploit kids seen using exploits for CVE. Yes, you are correct. It is magnitude. $300 uh, imaginary to the gentleman in the front row. All right, anyone? Concepts 100. The answer is CVE 2016 0034. This is a hundred dollar question, so it's not too complicated to say what this is. Not flash. You're you're getting too specific. There you go. Thank you. I, I've heard people say, "Oh, a CV 2016-0034, and they're describing an exploit. It's like, no, that's a vulnerability. Say CVE 2016-0034 exploit, and then you're fine. But don't just call an uh, exploit a vulnerability. And we'll do one more here before I sign off. Anyone? What is an exploit kit plus infrastructure that directs potential victims to it? There you go. 200 imaginary dollars. The gentleman who answered that question. And that's it. I don't want to waste any more of you guys' time. Thank you very much for uh, coming out and uh, bearing with me. Thank you.